the first of February, that night the Pantai Rakyat Singapura had a central committee meeting in uh, Bukit Timah Road. So I was invited to that uh, meeting, although I was not a uh, member of the central committee. You see, their purpose was to decide on inviting me to become the chairman of the party. I uh, went to the to the meeting, and I think it was by midnight they decided to uh, appoint me the new chairman of the party, which I accepted. You see, having uh, uh, accepted the position of the chairmanship and the uh, meeting was uh, uh, finished, so I left the place to come back to the house, which was in Gelang. I was with another friend, Hussein Jahidin, with me. Uh, we drove, I drove the car to the house in Gelang Srai. But before I turned into the, the small lane that goes into the house, I saw a couple of people at the roadside, as if they were waiting for me to come back. And they they suit up, they immediately, you know, talking among themselves, and they disperse. I assumed there must have been special branch people. Uh, so I went to the house, and then uh, almost two o'clock. Actually, that that night uh, we were already prepared. My wife was preparing things for me because I was supposed to leave for Jakarta the next morning. And uh, so I had about two hours sleep. By three thirty, four o'clock, uh, I had a knock, a very big knock in, on the door. Uh, that was 2nd February 1963, early morning, uh, around 4.30. And these people came, the special branch people, about six of them. They came up to the house, they ransacked the room, and they started asking all sorts of nonsense. You know, picking up this, picking up that. At the same time, they had about a, a jeep load of Gurkha soldiers with guns and all, you know, surrounded, surrounded my, my house. And very stupidly, they, they think they want to run away, <laughs> you know. And then uh, in that early morning like that, the villagers, you know, people around, they were all very curious, surprised that things like that happened. But none of them dared to come up. When they were ransacking the house, they were not saying anything, of course. I kept on asking, what the hell, what the hell are you doing all this thing? They just kept quiet and did what they wanted to do, pick up for a few books. Took up, took my passport away, my, everything that I was, you know, my wife prepared for me to take to Jakarta conference uh, were taken by them. And uh, after the after the, the ransacking, they handcuffed me and then t- took me to the car. It was, I think, uh, midway between Gelang to Outram when the special branch officer who arrested me. Inspector Hashim, Sim Ahmad, I think. He was the one who started telling me, uh, well, Chet Said, you will be in the big newspaper tomorrow. All the newspapers will be splashing your picture. I say, why? Well, why? Why my arrest? Uh, why should it be a big news? No, 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 you are not the only one. In other words, as he was telling me, the Operation Cold Star was on, hundreds of people have been arrested, and that I was one of them. You see, that morning, uh, we were all taken to Oakton Prison. So I was both taken to Oakton Prison, and I think for two or three days. They had a little interview there, internal interrogation. But there was nothing serious, just a casual kind of interrogation. And the next time, I think about third, the third or fourth day, then I was taken to the Central Police Station on the Upper Pickering Street. I think that police station is no more there now. The whole place has been demolished. You see, the, this police station had, I think, th- three or four uh, floors. The third floor is reserved for use of political detainees, uh, putting them on solitary confinement. They have different types of cells there. First, maybe first category, second category, and third category. 
and I was confined in one of the first category cells which is a very small room very dark very dirty and um, you don't know you know you, you will immediately lose your sense of time because there was a small bulb up the ceiling the light is very small very dim and the cell had a, had a peephole on the door you see in other words the, the Gurkha police who took uh, uh, were guarding the place could look at us from outside you know by lifting the thing through the spy, the, the spy hole they call it and we don't know who they are but our room is a bare room you know one cement bed on the side and then they have very dirty uh, this uh, coconut house uh, mattress very old one very dirty and torn here and there that was the first impression that I had so I was thinking how, how am I going to stay on a place like, place like this but perhaps I have no choice you see the first solitary confinement I had in, in Central Police Station for, for, for about three months that was the first of four other solitary confinement that I subsequently but that was the toughest uh, period of my detention actually and um, you know the type of interrogation very intense very I mean very oppressive you see most political detainees uh, almost all every single one was tortured but not necessarily physically all uh, in my case for instance I was definitely tortured mentally not physically they didn't touch me they didn't slap me as they did to many others I don't know why they didn't do it I was actually quite ready to <laughs> wait for that kind of thing you know knowing their character but anyway to me I think the mental torture was much more serious much more damaging but somehow I managed to you know to go through it managed to face this kind of this thing. perhaps because I had some knowledge about it you know through reading uh, of experiences of other detainees not only in the country but all over the world so I sort of expected the kind of treatment they would give and in solitary, solitary confinement particularly you uh, you will go through a very very tough time you have no one to talk to you have nothing to read no one will come and talk to you when they put the food they just open a little bit put it there and close again and you call them try to find an excuse to talk they just pretend that they don't hear you and just went off I went through this for some time you know and it was very tough uh, so much so that I tried to even to talk to myself I just shout at things I sing I sang songs and things like that just to to release some feeling and it turned out to be okay and then uh, when interrogation interrogation started they will take you out uh, well as I've described in the book that I've written the first one the interrogation method is very obvious in the first two weeks it was very intense and very aggressive so if you can you can pass through this to it then you should be okay for some for, for reason unknown to me I never did feel that my life was threatened until at one point when I was interrogated by none other than the deputy director himself Ahmad Khan so when he came in uh, he had a, he was accompanied by about six seven special branch officers all Malays I must tell you this that was uh, uh, still a fasting man during the fasting man period and uh, Ahmad Khan of course I wanted to make use of his Islam Islamic <laughs> uh, status uh, to try to talk to me as a fellow Muslim fine uh, when he said you know as a fellow Muslim we should uh, you know we should be honest uh, be frank about things uh, we like to help you perhaps you should cooperate with us that's the only way we can help you and I remember telling him that you cannot help me if you want to help me you just release me because that, that, that's no reason how can you help me for release I, ca I cannot accept this uh, arrest and detention in the first place and I said that, that how can I cooperate with people who arrested me I refuse to cooperate with people 
Then he said, Ahmad Khan became very stern and very angry. You see, he could show his face, was very angry. Well, you have no choice. You have to cooperate. Well, I said, uh, Mr. Khan, I think I have a choice. I refuse to cooperate with you. Come what may. I say something like that, you know. All right, you want to be tougher? Huh? You know that you, your life can be in danger also if you are taking a very tough line. You know that you can even get killed, is it? And you know that we can release you in the middle of the night and then as you were walking in the road, we can push you from behind and I can shoot you from behind. Finish. You are finished, right? Is that what you want? I said, no, of course not. That's not what I want. But is that what you want to do on me? I'm not surprised, I said, because things like this happen in other countries. All the colonialists and their students are doing things like this. You can do it. I know you can do it. But it's up to you, I said. So he was very angry. See, after that, he refused to ask any more questions. He just threw out, stood up and went off. But I was worried. You see, for the first time, I was worried for my life. Because I thought, what if they really do it? You know, things like that. But anyway, I, there's nothing else I can do in the, in the cell, back to the cell. I kept on thinking about it, you know. And true enough, I think, uh, because the cell is checked every 15 minutes. The Gurkha fellow will come and check every 15 minutes, you know. So every 15 minutes they come, I was wondering whether this uh, Amar Khan and company came to fetch me out. So that is, that if at all, that was the only time that I felt threatened. You were arrested under the orders of the Internal Security Council, <coughs> which were then made up of representatives from the British, Singapore and the Malayan Federation governments. Yeah. But after 9th of August 1965, when Singapore became an independent and sovereign nation, yeah. you continued to remain in prison under, under the new Singapore government. Why was that? Yeah, that is very interesting. Because, you see, first of all, the so-called Internal Security Council formed up by the three, by the Singapore government, the British and the Malaysian, and uh, the Malayan government. This Security Council was supposed to decide on matters of security. But beyond that, I think each government has got their own their own political agenda, you know, to perform. And the British, of course, being the colonial masters, playing the bigger role there, especially particularly on matters of Singapore. This is where Lee Kuan Yew uh, has always been collaborating with the British to make sure that his political power uh, can be retained. Without the British support, Lee Kuan Yew has no chance of doing that. Now, so this Internal Security Council of the Three Nations actually uh, is to help Lee Kuan Yew retain his uh, power in Singapore because Singapore was undergoing a political changes. A, a, a new round of constitutional talk was supposed to uh, be held in, in 1963 and Singapore has to hold an election during that period, something like that. So Lee Kuan Yew was very worried about it and he actually almost begged the British and later on he begged the Tengku to, to help him retain his power in Singapore. Uh, Singapore was very lucky. Actually, Singapore independence can be said was given by the Tengku. Lee Kuan Yew did not fight for independence. Lee Kuan Yew never fought for independence. He never fought against uh, colonial power, although he said that he's anti-colonialist calling himself socialist and things like that. But he never really fought against the British. He collaborated with the British from the very beginning to the end until now. And at one time, he had to beg the Tunggu to accept him into the merger, you know, of uh, uh, Malaya and then Malaysia. But Lee Kuan Yew, being Lee Kuan Yew, he always want to show that he is the great leader. He want to show his toughness. But now we all know after reading the declassified uh, document from the record office in London, open to the public, I've read bundles of them uh, in the recent years, we know that Lee Kuan Yew, even the British said Lee Kuan Yew is actually a coward. And I have been saying that Lee Kuan Yew is a coward, a political coward. So you see, it is was under these circumstances that when Singapore was kicked out of the Federation of Malaysia, 
you know, after he was making all sorts of, all sorts of problem for the Tunku, and Singapore got the so-called independence. Of course, that is the first time Singapore became a sovereign state. Now, when Singapore became an independent state, sponsored by Malaysia, even the entry to the United Nations was sponsored by Malaysia, then Singapore was lucky to be an independent country, supported by Malaysia, by the British and the rest of the world. Your question of why, even after that, political detainees like us, who were in the first place arrested and detained because of merger, Singapore, Malaya, and Malaysia. And yet, when Singapore was no longer in Malaysia, we were still being detained. And this is where you can, anybody who studies Lee Kuan Yew's personality, Lee Kuan Yew's mentality, Lee Kuan Yew's politics, and cunningness, and this is where you will find out. He refused to, to release. I remember uh, reading somewhere a statement by Lord Selkirk, who already went back to London. He said something like this, all these detainees should be released. Now that Singapore is no longer in Malaysia, then they should be released. But Lee Kuan Yew just ignored him. I remember also at one time, uh, Lee Kuan Yew invited a few journalists from Malaysia to visit Singapore. So at one of the press conferences, one journalist asked, uh, why is Said Zari still being detained? And uh, he was a Malaysian journalist. So Lee Kuan Yew said, well, uh, we, I have to continue something like that. No, I have to continue to detain Said Zari because Malaysia wanted me to do so. In other words, he was trying to put the blame on Malaysia for my continued distension after uh, August 9, 1965. Then, of course, the Malaysian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Affairs denied that. And Kuan Yu ignored the denial. And that is Lee Kuan Yu. You know, the, uh, he is a, he's a person who couldn't care less what other people think. So that's how I was detained, in spite of uh, Singapore not being in Malaysia anymore. Did you expect to be detained for so long? Ah, good question. No, I did not expect. You see, I, I, of course, I couldn't say for how long I would detain, but definitely not this long. Uh, at that time, because the political situation was changing very fast, you know, from from merger to Malaysia and then to Singapore being kicked out again and then to Malaysia having big problem with Indonesia and so on and so forth. So I considered my detention is related to all those things because that is what they wanted to do. But I never expected it to be detained for this long particularly after Singapore was out of Malaysia and uh, after uh, Indonesian Malaysia confrontation all over Singapore they all become friends again they form an ASEAN that was in late 60s I think 67 and yet Lee Kuan Yew wanted to do that I did not expect and while in Changi prison you decided to learn Mandarin me wish more wish young Xue Hua Yin oh wow this is a very difficult question uh,这是讲的,我,我认为啊,在,我们在,在见到里面,一,大多数的我们,我的同志们,都是说,中教育的。所以,班上他们是讲话一样。虽然说,他们也是会讲话一样。然后,我们也是,参加这个classes,每个
比较容易明白我的想法了，我也可以明白他们的想法了。他们其实这个理由啊，啊，我就更努力的学习这个华文。The Singapore government had accused you of being a prominent leader of the Communist United Front. They had also claimed that you had refused to renounce the use of force to change the government. What is your response to these charges? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, they accused me in the in the allegation of fact, so called. One of the allegations said uh, that I, I was a leading member of the Communist United Front, CUF, whatever that means, you know. To me, it was like a phantom organization, you know. Nobody knows really what is CUP, Communist United Front. Well, fair enough. I mean, they want to detain me. I mean, I was not the only one being accused of prominent member. There are so many others. Prominent member of CUP, uh, Communist United Front, was one of the uh, so-called allegations against me. They also have accused me of being a foreign agent, accused me of being Chinese, accused me of being Indonesian agent, whatever. I mean. you know, there were 17 of them. You see, after we appeared on the, uh, they have at that time, appeal committee or something, appeared just to to, to debunk this allegation. The second time I received second reason, from 17 it came down to 10. The 17 accusation disappeared. And so on and so forth. So this so-called allegation of facts are actually nothing but uh, an excuse for them to detain us. How else can they, uh, you know, accuse us of being? But I challenge them even on the charges of being a foreign agent. Once I remember, I said, okay, fine. If I'm a foreign agent, it's a very serious matter. Why don't you charge me in court? Convict me, I'll be, I may be even shot by fire, firing squad. Why don't you? Two, three times I challenged them. Then suddenly that one also dropped. So by in the end, I think there were a few. And of course, this UF accusation will remain because that's the only thing they can. And with regard to the second part of your question uh, refuse to renounce what is that uh, violence use of force uh, to to what to what? Change to change the government this is very interesting this is a blatant lie actually this lie is Lee Kuan Yew's lie you know what happened after I think it was after 16 years I was in prison I received a letter from Lord Goodman uh, of the uh, the masters of the Oxford University in London, I was quite surprised because I didn't know what Lord Goodman. But then he was good enough to write me a letter, and in that letter, he said that the Amnesty International had asked him to write to Lee Kuan Yew about my detention. To ask Lee Kuan Yew why a person like Sai Zahari was still being detained after 16 years. So in reply to Lord Goodman, according to that letter, Lee Kuan Yew said the only reason the side is still being detained was because he refused to renounce violence. And this, after 16 years, you know, this so-called refused to renounce violence whatever, had never been mentioned to me, had never been told to me for the last 16 years. As I told you earlier, all the 16 allegations of facts so-called uh, against me to, to, to detain me, None uh, has, uh, was referred to this so-called violence or uh, using or refused to uh, renounce violence and so on and so forth. And I explained uh, in my letter in reply to Lord Goodman. I said, I, I, I'm sure, I mean, I didn't, I didn't send the letter because I knew a letter wouldn't be sent back to him. But I explained in my book. You see, the reason why I cannot accept Lord Goodman's is because Lord Goodman doesn't seem to know, and I don't blame him, not to know the condition, my condition in detention, and why I was detained, and what happened during the last 16 years. And I explained all these things, you see. In November of 1978, the government decided to transfer you to Yubin Island. You see, one morning suddenly they removed me from the prison, from the MCC, went to the interrogation center in Whitley uh, Road. After the central police station was demolished, they built up a new one. 
much more oppressive, much more secretive, uh, more room, more room for torture. Uh, when I was in Central Police Station, I only described my room as a dungeon of horror, but there were plenty of dungeons of horrors in Whitley Road. Now I was suddenly taken there, but of course I was not put into those dungeons anymore because they they already changed their uh, their political line. And uh, it was in the, during that period in Whitley Road uh, Center, I was told that I would be removed somewhere else. And uh, true enough, after two or three weeks, I was taken to Pulau Ubin. You know, this Pulau Ubin, later on, I came to know from the officer in charge of my case. One day he was telling me, you know, Syed, we surveyed this island for three months uh, before we decided to put you here. And not only that, we built up a little hut for you in the middle of the island. I said, why you take so much trouble? Why you spend so much people's money on this kind of thing? Just for me to stay in the little hut, you spend so much money. He said, well, security. What kind of security you feel that I might run away or what? I don't know how to see me when you know, you <laughs> see if I wanted to. Well, that was the uh, the irony of things, you know. They are their mentality, their thinking. Now, I suppose this is more, I, I look at it from political reason for them to put me on the island. I think it was one way of Lee Yu to save a little face. His face has become so, you know, so dirty he was to, to save a little bit more, politically speaking, you know. So, uh, instead of releasing me straight away on the main island, I think this happened a few months after Lord Goodman's letter to me, my 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 exile to Pulau Ubin. So Lee Kuan Yew wanted to do kind of little face-saving kind of device. Put me on the island, sort of as a transition to a proper release on the mainland. And of course, I never believed that when I was there, I was ready to release. It was just a bigger prison without wall. And uh, I could see my family once a week, you know, they would come freely without without supervision, without restriction to this, that and the other. That went on for a year. When they finally, I think Lee Kuan Yew said, uh, we cannot find any other excuse but to release him. When I was arrested first, it was fasting month. And when they wanted to release, it was also fasting month. And on the almost, in fact, I think three days before Hari Raya, fasting was, was to end, uh, then suddenly they come, they said, Syed, uh, now at last we are sending you home. So my impression was that the government, I think, had, especially the pressure on the government was so strong that the Kanyun has no more excuse to delay and to stop from uh, me from being released. And uh, I believe that uh, at that time there was a campaign by the American government of uh, Carter administration, I think. Carter administration had a special committee on human rights. And uh, I remember a, a lady who headed that committee was sent down to South Association to visit these places, you know, to, to on human rights issue. And they came to Singapore. And she wanted to meet us, but Lee Kuan Yew stopped her. Even at that point in time, Lee Kuan Yew was afraid to allow us to talk to uh, people like that, uh, doing human rights work. And that was from the American government. And that, that, that's why I said Lee Kuan Yew is a coward. He was so afraid that he would be exposed. Was the release unconditional or conditional? Yes, unconditional in the sense I did not write, I did not sign any uh, release condition, but conditional in the sense that uh, I have to, uh, uh, that I cannot go into politics, I cannot join this, cannot join that. That was condition, although I did not sign it, but I was still uh, bound by that kind of condition, <coughs> which to me means nothing because there was no politics for me to go into anyway. Uh, I think that when that condition went on for about two years or three years, and they slowly removed them. Yeah.
Over the last four decades or so, hundreds of political and social activists have been detained under the Internal Security Act. Many of whom were released after a few months, some after a few years. Yeah. But you were detained for 17 long years. Yeah. Why were you detained for so long and how did you manage to survive all these years? Hundreds of detainees together, uh, arrested together with me on 2nd of February. But after that, there were many, many more, hundreds more uh, people were arrested and detained and then released, detained and released. You see, some were detained for a very brief period of time uh, and the others much longer. I'm, although 70 years, I'm not the longest detainee in Singapore. Together with me, same period was Dr. Lim Hock Su. Uh, Hock Su and I uh, uh, were detained for 17 years, I mean, you know, that period. But, there is Chia Tai Po, as you must uh, know, was detained much longer. I think it was detained for 27 years or something like that. 32. 32 years, huh? including his Santosa period of time. Until he finally was released, he was detained for 32 years. And that is what Lee Kuan Yew is. Such a vindictive person like Lee Kuan Yew. What? Person like Chia Tai Po. Poor little, little fellow was 26 when he joined me in prison. He was a lecturer at the Nanyang University. He was very eager in his political... He has a political principle. He wants to establish a democratic and free country. Then uh, Lee Kuan Yew accused him also of being communist, Sajari communist, everybody is communist. Because that is the only... Uh, you know, things that he can do to, to, to detain us. But why detain for so long? It's very interesting. He, when, when he detained me seven, two, for 17 years, until today, he cannot explain why he detained for 17 years. When I was in Hong Kong, during the launch of this book, I was interviewed by CNN. And of course about my detention, about book, and I mentioned about all these things. They were asking me, why were you detained for so long in the same way? I gave the same answer. And I said, the only person who can answer this question is... Lee Kuan Yew. So if you happen to interview me again, you go and ask him. True enough, I was told, a week after an interview with me, Lee Kuan Yew was going to China and stopped over in Hong Kong, was invited by the same CNN program. And when he was asked about my this and Lee Kuan Yew, don't ask uh, about Sai Zari or this thing. You can ask about any other thing. And that's Lee Kuan Yew. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, but... I mean, everybody, if you read my book, there's people who wrote forward and so on, you can see that the only reason why Lee Kuan Yew did that is because he could not face me in a political uh, uh, battle in, the, in Singapore politics. For a reason only known to him. Because uh, although he knew what kind of politi what politics I had, whole principle, but he preferred to accuse me of being a communist only because... He wanted to detain me for so long. Until he felt very sure, very safe, that there will be no political opposition, effective political opposition, then he decided to release us. Let Kaksu go out, let Posuka out, let me out, uh, and the rest of the, of the detainees. How did you manage to cope? Well, coping 17 years is, I must tell you very frankly, is, is very tough. You know, there are two things that you have to, I have to consider. My family, for instance. My family went through 16, 17 years of life without me. My children, when I was a well, little, little fellow, you know, five, six, three, and so on. <coughs> and my wife had to do some work, to do catering services. But fortunately, all our friends in Singapore helped her, supported her, so she managed to... Uh, go through. The reason why I I uh, maintain my standard is just to to uh, counter this accusation against me. It's uh, uh, an accusation which was deliberately fabricated by Lee Kuan Yew first by Lee Kuan Yew and the British, and helped by the Tunku, and then later on Kuan Yew maintained that kind of uh, uh, accusation. You know, Lee Kuan Yew being a vindictive person like that. He wants to make that you must say sorry, you must admit defeat, you must surrender. And I told myself, Lee Kuan, you will never get that from me. 
even when I was in, in the, on the island. Lee Kuan Yew can send me. If he thinks I can rot in prison, he'll be very sorry that he is wrong. So I uh, managed to maintain my stand and principle and I'm happy that I did. I'm, I don't regret at all that I spent that much time in prison, yeah. Do you still hold grudges against those responsible for your detention? Oh, let this, uh, uh, I, I have repeated this many times, you know, when other people have been asking me about grudges. I do not hold grudges against anybody because to me, my political detention was motivated by my political struggle and political principle. And those who did that to me, in particular, particularly people like Lee Kuan Yew, put me into prison. Oh, he has also his political uh, principle. But the only, the, the only difference is that his politics is a colonial politics. My politics is an independent politics. Uh, I, my friend and I are struggling for the establishment of a United Democratic Malaya. Whereas Lee Kuan Yew wanted to maintain the colonial status of the country, although without mentioning it. So this is the difference. And therefore, the, my detention was political, and even he, whatever method and to use, was also for his political reason. So my grudge is not against him personally or any other person, but against the political stand of uh, Lee Kuan Yew and company and the British and so on, yeah. Why is it that ex-political detainees in Singapore are reluctant to publicize their experiences? Well, uh, I think one, one, one reason that I can think of, and I think I am not wrong, is that the, 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 the situation in Singapore, you know, the political climate in Singapore, the environment, and the policy of the government. You know, as you see, only those people who have left Singapore uh, wrote their memoir. Francis Xiao is one of them. And, and even Devon Naya. Devon had written his memoir. When is he to, going to publish it? I don't know. <clears throat> but for sure, Francis Xiao had written three or four books. He only could do it outside Singapore. Even in my case, I started writing my memoir only when I came up here and became a fellow at the university. That was the beginning of my writing. Now, in Singapore, the, it's not definitely the situation is not conducive to doing things like this. Although Singapore will say, uh, they will say that, why don't you do it in Singapore? You are free now. Nobody stop you from writing, yes. But they can do a lot of putting, making things difficult for you. If, if you are an old man, then your children may not be able to get easily get a job, even to get into the university. And then if your wife is working in the government, when you sure to be, you know, uh, this has happened. And I don't think they can deny this, because they have been doing it and they are still doing it. And for this reason, I think many of the ex detainees who are still in Singapore and have nowhere else to go and uh, are very reluctant to write. This is very typical of Lee Kuan Yew's uh, policy, you know. He will regard uh, a person who is not with him as an enemy. And once he regards you as an enemy, until you die or until he dies, you will become his political enemy. Whether you are sitting in prison or outside prison, or whether you are active or non-active, uh, that is the sad thing about Li Kuan Yew. He's supposed to be brilliant. He's supposed to be brilliant. He's a brilliant person. But he's not a brilliant person. He's not a brilliant person. He's not a This is a very sad thing, I think, for Singapore. Are you still a citizen of Singapore? Do you have any intention of returning to Singapore? Yes, I am still a citizen of Singapore. I do not uh, intend to give up my citizenship of Singapore. I see no reason why should I. I was born in Singapore. I grew up in Singapore. I was, you know, in Singapore, I love Singapore. Singapore is my country. I used to consider and still partly consider Singapore as part of Malaya. Still a one country, a united Malaya. In my heart of heart, we are still one. You know, this political arrangement is all uh, man-made. You know, but geographically, 
uh, culturally, we are one people. I see no reason why it should be separated. And therefore, I do not intend to give up my citizenship of Singapore. But right now, I am fortunate enough to be given the status of permanent resident here. So I do all my work here, which I cannot do in Singapore. I, I am saying it in my second book. It is impossible for me to do what I am doing now, do it in Singapore. Uh, I don't think uh, you can interview me also in Singapore like this. But it is a fact. It's a fact of life. And you know, you know it. And you enjoy is doing it. I enjoy doing what I'm doing, you know. You have published two books about your experiences and you are in the midst of writing the third volume. Are you not afraid that the Singapore government, in particular Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, would take offence and act against you? <laughs> yeah. Well, if Lee Kuan Yew wanted to act, if he could, he already had acted upon the release of my first book. In my case, there is nothing that Lee Kuan Yew can do. He can sue the book he wants, but I cannot see how he can sue me. In fact, I don't mind if he wants to sue the book or ban the book, because uh, whatever I said was true. Your wife, Salama, passed away recently. How are you coping now, and what do you do these days? Well, well, that it was, uh, you know, it's a great loss after 49 years together. And my wife, Salama, was very helpful, very supportive of my work. So without her, I had to, you know, had a long period of difficulty to cope, especially in life. And in a way, fortunately, I had some experience of being alone <coughs> for so long, you know. I had a wife. But I was without my wife uh, in a life in prison. So in a way, it is now back to that square again. Uh, you know, ever since my wife uh, passed away, I had to cope with myself. Although I have my daughter here, the children are here, but they can't be of much help to me, you know. So I decided to set up this uh, <laughs> this place for my for my studies. Uh, my bedroom and my also workstation, so I work most of the time in this room. Unless I have to go out for to give a lecture or one at the university, from time to time they still invite me. Before your arrest in 1963, you were the editor of Utusan Melayu. <coughs> in 1961, you initiated a press strike to protest Amno's takeover of your newspaper. I was a journalist actually for a very short period of time, you know, 61, uh, 51 to 61. It so happened that I became the, the editor-in-chief in 1959. They tried to control the paper earlier. They couldn't do it. So when I became the editor, they thought this young fellow might be different from Yusuf Isa, who was about 10 to 15 years older than me at that time. Yusuf, you know, eh? he was the first editor-in-chief. So they might have thought that Said Zari, being young, maybe will be more, uh, more easier to sort of, you know, get him around. But to me, that was my political, uh, my, my stand on journalism. You see, I work for a newspaper that works for the people. A newspaper that serves the people, not serve the party in power. And Utsu Samlawi has been known until then, until the strike, as an independent newspaper, supporting or, or rather uh, uh, fighting for the interests of the of the underdogs of the people in the rural areas the workers and the poor people we always bring up issues from this whether they are peasants or they are workers apparently the the Tunku's government at that time having come to power having made an agreement with the British that bound him into following British policy especially economically and even politically so he found it difficult to allow an independent newspaper to keep on criticizing him. In my uh, first book, I did explain a few things that we came into conflict with the Tunku on peasants' issues, on foreign affairs, on other social issues that I, uh, in the newspaper, we always raised up. So, when uh, the, uh, the, the strike was actually the, the culmination of that, you know, development. As far as I'm, I was concerned, when I became the editor, I continued to, to maintain the original policy of the paper to serve the people, the country and the nation. I mean the religion 
Islam and the nation. And I went on for that. I, I, I stood by that. Although they tried to, you know, induce me with all sorts of things so that I can give up that policy in text becoming a newspaper owned by uh, the party, which I refused to allow. In Malaysia, mm. they, you are known as the champion of press freedom. In uh. Singapore, you, hardly anyone knows you, and the Singapore government will still probably accuse you of having been a communist. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. So, what, what know, is your legacy? I know. I'm not surprised if uh, Singapore maintained that. So I couldn't care less anymore, you know, uh, because uh, uh, they know that they, they are not telling the truth. And I don't know why Lee Kuan Yew wanted to continue to do that. It's a pity, you know, it's a sad thing, honestly it's sad. A person in his standing, uh, his brilliance, uh, should stop doing it. I, I would love to see Lee Kuan Yew say, I made a mistake about Sai Zari. Why not? You know, no harm. Legacy, I don't know how to say it. I mean, yes, people say that I'm championing freedom. I mean, yes, that is true. I am still championing freedom of the press. But you see, the circumstances is very much different now. A lot of laws, you know, controlling the press. And this has to be removed. I, I was interviewed by many people. I said, any laws that restrict the, the movement of the, the, this thing must be removed. Particularly the ISA, because ISA is the, 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 the real culprit of all these things, you know, all the other laws are governed by the ISA. So long as ISA is there, they create all sorts of other laws. So don't talk about freedom of the press. But in Singapore, and I mean in Malaysia at least, you can still publish. You can criticize Badawi every day, you know. They wallop and my baby every day and nothing happened to that. But you do that in Singapore, oh my dear. Don't try. <laughs> no use. It's a waste of time. Yeah. Today, both Malaysia and Singapore insist that the Internal Security Act is still relevant. As an ex detainee yourself, what are your views on the ISA? You see, they have been using ISA supposed to be uh, in the interest of security. But who's security? The older people detained like me, like so many others. Whose security was that? Uh, that our detention was. Equal security, yes. But definitely not the security of Singapore. In similar way, even here, uh, even the Malaysian government, I've been interviewed many times. I made my position very clear. As an ex-detainee, I cannot accept this. In fact, I would be very happy if, or rather I would demand together with the, uh, this thing to, uh, to demolish uh, this ISA. The sooner it is done, the better it will be for the people, for the country, and uh, uh, for the government even.